Good morning. It's good to see all of you here on this uh, rather wet but uh, mild Sunday morning as we join together to uh, worship our God and Father today. Be sure to get a bulletin if you did not get one on your way in. A lot of information in there. Uh, your Bible study guide for today. Uh, do have a couple of updates to the prayer request list to share with you. Uh, first of all, uh, Dot Little continues to recover from RSV. Uh, her great-grandson, Nolan, uh, continues in ICU. He was born premature, and as a result of that, he's having to spend some time there, but uh, he is holding his own and, and making slow, positive progress, and so we are thankful for that. Uh, Steve Gill uh, continues to uh, have uh, some heart-related issues that they are trying to get managed. Uh, also, Matt Cook uh, had a brief hospital stay this past week. Um, he had uh, an issue with his hip and uh, then had to be in the uh, Lebanon uh, Pavilion rehab for that, but he is home now and we are glad for that. And also, <clears throat> Paul Gentry has a procedure uh, tomorrow. Uh, they are going to be uh, putting an epidural in in order to uh, provide some pain medicines for his, his back. And so they have requested prayers on on his behalf, that that will uh, that procedure will go well, and that uh, the uh, the medication will be uh, effective in what it is designed to do. Those are all the prayer requests that uh, I have. Is there anything that I uh, am not aware of that we need to share with the family? Fall Fest tonight at six o'clock. Chili supper. All the information, all the details on that are in the bulletin. It's always good to have Brian with us, and I will turn the service over to him. Good morning. We will start out the worship this morning with Here I Am to Worship, which will be on the screen only. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a
Pray with me, please. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for, for this day and for all the things you bless us with. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be able to to come out here today and to, to study your word, to hear, to hear a lesson of your word. Father, we thank you so much for those answered prayers. We, we thank you for the unanswered prayers, Father, at this time. We pray for all those mentioned here this morning. Father, we pray for the Fuller family, we pray for the Lambs, pray for the Thompsons, the Littles, and the Gills, and Mr. And Mac Cook, and Father, pray for Paul Gentry, Father, pray for for anyone else that that is in need, be it spiritual or physical. Father, we pray for our country, we pray for the leaders of our country that they look to you for guidance. <clears throat> Father, we pray that as as we study your word here today, that as Alan brings our lesson, that we'll take it to heart and take something out of it to to bring someone closer to thee. Father, pray with us as we be with us as we leave here today. God, Lord, direct us and keep us living in a manner that one day bring us on to thee. In Christ's name, amen. Next song will be I Stand Amazed, number 299. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus Nazarene. Yeah. 
Let's also give thanks for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, we know from your from reading your word that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. 
all the sacrifices that were made in the past just roll forward the the, the sins and appease you for a time period but it took the perfect land to remove the sins of the world and we're so thankful that Jesus was willing to make that sacrifice that we too can live with you one day be with us now as we take this fruit of the vine which represents that life saving blood in Jesus name We are a very blessed people. If, if we had nothing else but the but the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, that would, it would save our soul. That would be more than enough. But God has blessed us so richly, and we have an opportunity now to to thank Him and to remember the many blessings that we we enjoy because of because of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the ways that you take care of us. You provide for us in so many ways, and, and our health is in your hands. Our life is in your hands. Father, we ask that you would be with us as we give back a portion of the physical blessings that we've been given. We ask that you would be with the ones who decide how these funds are to be used. That they may bring glory to your name in this community and throughout the world. So Christ let me pray. Amen. <coughs> Our next song is going to be Be Still and Know, number 844 in our books. Be still and know that I Standing on the promises of Christ my King 
through eternal ages let its praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. God, 
which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so only two verses, but three very important things for us to consider this morning. Uh, first of all, Paul wants us to know that holy living revolves around the worship of God. Notice the wording of verse 1. Paul tells us that yielding our bodies to the Lord is our reasonable service. The word reasonable comes from the same word from which we get our English word for logic. So, so, so what is reasonable? Well, first of all, it is that which is logical. And Paul says it is logical for us as the people of God to yield our bodies to God. Uh, then the word service comes into play. And, and the Greek word here speaks specifically of sacred service. The type of service that the Levitical priests would perform in the Old Testament. Now this should uh, seem to be fairly logical because remember, uh, Peter would tell us that we are priests. Uh, we are a holy priesthood in and of ourselves. And so yes, the service that we as individuals perform are going to be service that is sacred service. Service to the Lord. So therefore, this phrase means that yielding our bodies to the Lord is our logical service of worship before the Lord. And you know, nothing says I love you, Lord, like consecrated, dedicated, holy living. It was Jesus Himself who in John 14 said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Uh, and so in this first verse, with this in mind, uh, let's look at what Paul means when he says that we should yield up our bodies. He first of all gives us a challenge that we are to present our bodies. This has reference to the body of flesh that you and I wear around. And I believe that Paul is saying that we yield up our bodies and along with our sinful desires. Paul is calling us in the present with all that we have to serve God with all that we have. The word present carries with it the idea of placing at one's disposal. And so this is available for you. Nothing would aggravate me any more than when I was in the transportation industry and every now and then we would have to rent a truck because we just didn't always have the number of trucks that we needed or all of our trucks were, were busy. Uh, and I always, uh, we always use Robbins. It's now Penske on First Avenue in Nashville. It was Robbins at, at the time. And nothing would aggravate me any more than when I would reserve a vehicle to pick up on this day at this time, and then when I get there, it's not ready. It's, it's not there. What's the point of a reservation? What's the point of a reservation if when you get there to pick it up, it's not there for you to pick up, right? That vehicle was supposed to be there for my disposal, for my usage. And, and that is what Paul is saying. We present our bodies, which means, yes, Lord, this life is for you. It, it is the idea behind Isaiah when he said, here am I, send me. The idea here is one of total surrender to God. And there are a lot of people who want to be saved, but they are not willing to lay everything on the altar for the Lord. They are guilty of holding things back in their lives that are too precious to them. And yet Paul says we are called to give our all to God. And then he gives us a reason. He gives us the cause. Notice the phrase, by the mercies of God. That phrase carries our mind back to what the Apostle has been talking about. He's been talking about, before his aside in chapters 9-11, through 11, about how you and I, as the redeemed of God, have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. It is by God's grace 
that we are able to have our sins dealt with. He bought us at Calvary and we belong to Him. Paul would tell the Corinthian church in chapter 6, you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. It's the same idea, same concept that we see here in these two verses this morning. We have been bought with a price, therefore we ought to glorify God in our bodies. And then Paul addresses the idea of consecration. We are told that our bodies are to be living sacrifices. Now, I don't know about you, we don't think about this an awful lot, but when we think about a living sacrifice, that sounds dreadfully painful. It sounds dreadfully painful because we know about the sacrifices in the Old Testament. An individual would take a bull or a goat, slaughter that animal, uh, the blood of that animal would be sprinkled on the altar, the flesh of that animal would be cut into pieces, some of it would be given to the uh, priests, others of it would be burned on the altar. And that doesn't really sound like something that I would want to be a party to, personally, either as the one performing the sacrifice, much less the one who is the sacrifice. But the difference between what the Lord is calling us to do and what He called the people of old to do is that their sacrifice was to die. Our sacrifice is to live. Now, I guess you could argue that there are some ways in which living is harder than dying. Dying lets you off the hook in some instances. Uh, but uh, their sacrifice was to die. Ours is to live. But having said that, there are still some similarities between the two. Both sacrifices are costly. Both sacrifices are painful and difficult. Both sacrifices are personal and necessary. But what is God talking about as He inspires Paul to tell us that we are to be living sacrifices? Uh, four things about a living sacrifice before we move on. Uh, first of all, a living sacrifice means that you and I are to be on the altar wherever we are. We just aren't on the altar of service on Sunday. Uh, we are not called to be on that altar one day a week as a symbolic death in terms of the Old Testament sacrifices. A living sacrifice doesn't happen in one place at one time as the Old Testament sacrifices did. Secondly, <clears throat> A living sacrifice means a constant, continuous sacrifice. It's not a one-time thing, but it is an ongoing thing. Third, a living sacrifice means that the body sacrifices its own will for the will of God. To be a living sacrifice will require that the body doesn't live for the world, doesn't live for the flesh, doesn't live for self, but rather it lives for God in everything that it does. And fourth, a living sacrifice means that the body is devoted to the task of serving God. Uh, we are to lay down our ambitions, we are to lay down, lay down our desires, and we are to commit ourselves to doing God's will, not our own will, in our lives. And then Paul lays down the conditions. Paul tells us how these bodies are to be sacrificed, and he gives us two conditions that this sacrifice must meet. First of all, it must be an all full sacrifice. A W E. All inspiring, all full sacrifice. The word holy means something that is consecrated or set apart. It is special. It is unique. And it inspires awe in the sight of the observer. Awe in the sight of the worshiper. Imagine how awe-inspiring it must have been or would have been uh, to have stood with Elijah on Mount Carmel when fire rained down from heaven. Imagine how awe-inspiring it would have been to have stood with Moses as he stood there 
speaking to the burning bush. Imagine what it must have been like to stand with Solomon as he dedicated the temple and fire rained down from heaven. The idea here is that when we live a life that is completely devoted to God, a life that we symbolically place upon the altar, what an awe-inspiring thing that would be. What an awe-inspiring thing that should be. It demonstrates the power of God to transform lives like nothing else can. I am convinced that God can do more in a church with one properly sacrificed life than a thousand people who are half-heartedly playing the church game. And the question that comes to you and me is how much awe does your life inspire? And then secondly, it is an acceptable sacrifice. Paul says that it is acceptable, meaning well-pleasing or satisfying. When we think of the word acceptable, uh, we just tend to think of average, right? Uh, if you get an A or a B on an assignment, that's above average work. If you get a D or an F on an assignment, that is below average work. If you get a C, that is considered average work. And, and that's what we hear when we hear the word acceptable. Uh, but that is not what this Greek word implies. This Greek word implies the idea of above average. Uh, it, it is acceptable because it is well-pleasing in the sight of God. It is satisfying. Getting back to the grades analogy, there were times when I would bring home a grade and my parents would say, that's just not acceptable. It's not acceptable. Well, Mom, well, Dad, according to the school system, it is. Uh, but what they were getting at is we understand what you are capable of. We understand uh, that you are able to perform better than that. And, and so it is acceptable in the sense that you pass the class, but it is not well-pleasing. It's not well-pleasing because you are not living up to your potential. And, and that is what Paul is calling us to. To be acceptable doesn't mean that you have just met the minimum requirements. Uh, it is a life that is well-pleasing to God. And the sad truth is we are either pleasing to God or we are hurting God by the way in which we live our lives, by the way in which we use our bodies. Also, note the word brethren and you here in verse 1. Brethren and you. This command to sacrifice all on the altar is not a command for a select few super saints. Paul is writing to everyone in Rome. And so the word brethren suggests all. The word you suggests a specific command to the all who he is writing to. Not a single individual who has been saved by the blood of Jesus has a right to deny God the pleasure of our bodies being living sacrifices and powerful testimonies to the world. And so let us present our bodies as Paul suggests here. But then we also see that the uh, holy life is not just a holy life that involves worship to God. The holy life is a life that involves the wisdom of God as well. Uh, the first half of verse 2, Paul moves from dealing with the body to dealing with the mind. Uh, here is the root of all of our problems anyway. All of our problems are rooted in the mind. When we can get the mind to think how it should, then the body is going to fall in line with that. In the matter of conquering the mind, Paul says there are two steps that need to be taken. First of all, uh, the first step that needs to be taken is shunning the mold. We need to shun the mold. We are commanded to not be conformed to this world. The word conformed means to fashion, to shape, very literally to press into a mold. And we are not to allow the world to squeeze us into its mold. You and I are not to be like the world around us. You see, 
The world and those who are controlled by its influence are vastly different than what the Word of God calls us to. We see what the world would shape us into. In Galatians 5, Paul makes a list that clearly illustrates the line of demarcation between the child of God and the child of the world. He says, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, which I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, and so, uh, Paul could have added to this list. You and I could add to this list. Uh, Paul acknowledges that there are other things. These are just representative. Uh, but these things are opposed to God. And we are to avoid allowing the world to squeeze us into that mold. We must be different. We must remain different. And then Paul says the second step is shaping the mind. When we are commanded to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, <clears throat> uh, the word that Paul uses here, transformed, is the same word where we get our English word metamorphosis. And so the idea of a transformation is being changed from one state into another state. This process of metamorphosis, as you probably know, describes the process that a caterpillar goes through to become a butterfly. The caterpillar and the butterfly are the exact same creature, but it goes through a transformation. The caterpillar enters the cocoon and later emerges as the same creature, just changed, just transformed. And that is the change that God wants to effect in your life and my life this morning. You see, when you and I were baptized into Christ, the Spirit of God moved in. He transformed our spirit and changed us into His child. And now He wants to transform our minds so that the flesh might be changed. We must remember that the flesh will do what it's told to do. But in order for our bodies to be laid on the altar of service, the mind has to change. How is this accomplished? Well, in a sense, by surrendering our lives to the will of God. By filling our minds with the Word of God. By ordering one's life after the teachings and commands of God. By cutting one's off, oneself off from those influences that are trying to press and shape you into the mold that the world would have us to be formed into. You know, there are basically three, time, three types of Christians in the church. Uh, there are those who are sensual minded. Uh, this kind of individual is ruled by the physical world around them. They live by their senses. Uh, they are going to make decisions and act based on how they feel, what they see, how they are affected by those things. What they want, what they hear, what they see. Uh, they may be saved by the blood of Jesus, but they are living below their potential because uh, like a ship adrift at sea, what they think and how they act are based on all these external sensual stimuli. And then there are those who are soulish. Uh, these individuals are those who are ruled by the intellect, by the mind, uh, their will. These folks are harder to spot than the sensual ones. In fact, there's a fine line between the soulless person and the truly spiritual person. To the intellect, emotional, uh, or possess a strong will is not necessarily spiritual. Uh, let me illustrate. 
uh, the intellect. A person may know the Bible backwards and forwards. They may be a walking concordance. One of the leading theologians in the United States is a professor at Vanderbilt University and is an atheist. All right? So we may have extensive knowledge of the Word of God, but that doesn't mean that that individual is spiritual. Uh, and then we have our emotions. A man may shout and cry in worship services, may, may lift his hands. But these things are not necessarily spiritual in nature. Uh, too often they are just the actions of the emotions. The same person who shouts on Sunday at the top of his lungs may be in the valley come Monday morning. We have the will. A person may, when they come to Christ and have their sins dealt with by the blood of Jesus, decide that they are going to change how they live. They are going to give up those bad habits that they used to uh, participate in. But just because we've gotten rid of some physical bad habit doesn't necessarily mean that we are spiritual. The spiritual individual uh, is very rare in the church. These individuals who are under the control of the Holy Spirit, these individuals are individuals whom the Holy Spirit controls their thinking. And so their thinking is in line with the Word of God. Uh, the Holy Spirit controls their actions and you can count on their actions to be consistent with what the Word of God says. And this individual's mouth is controlled by the Holy Spirit and so his words are going to be the words that the Word of God calls us to as well. Well, how can we tell the difference between these four individuals? The sensual, the soulish, uh, and the spiritual. How can we tell the difference between these individuals? Well, the sensual person is not hard to spot. Uh, they stand out because they are selfish and carnal in the way in which they live, in the way in which they think, in the way in which they talk. The soulish individual is an individual who is going to make a logical decision without taking any other factors into place. The truly spiritual individual is one who is an instrument of the Spirit of God. In Ephesians 5, verse 18, Paul said this, Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, Paul uses a specific example there, but we see the transition, or, or, or the uh, we, we see the uh, difference in uh, the two. The one individual is living by the way of the world. And we could look at all of the deeds of the flesh. Paul could have picked any one of those here. But in contrast to that, the spirit individual is filled with the spirit. The spirit is the only thing that can teach us the difference between the soulish and the spiritual individual. Uh, this verse says that he is a discerner of the thoughts and our motives. And that word comes from a word that gives us our English word, critic. The Word of God is able to teach us the difference between right and wrong. Which of us are Spirit-filled and which of us are not Spirit-filled. Therefore, Paul's statement that the mind is renewed day by day carries with it this idea of daily transformation. You see, just as the body of the caterpillar hides the butterfly within. The flesh hides the glorious new man living inside every redeemed person until that day of transformation of the mind has come. The mind must be thought must be brought under the control of the Lord so that the flesh can be subdued and the new man who is made in the image of God can be free. As Paul told the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then Paul concludes by sharing with us the third aspect of holy living. And 
that is that holy living involves the will of God. Having told us the secret to a holy life revolves around worship of God through the sacrifice of the body and through the development of the mind of Christ, Paul moves on to tell us that accomplishing those things in our lives enable us to carry out the will of God in our lives. And so Paul shares with us two aspects of the will of God. Uh, the first aspect is a description of God's will. Paul uses three identifying adjectives to describe the will of God. First of all, it is precious. Regardless of what the Lord may ask of you, regardless of what the Lord may ask of me, His will is precious. And God will not ask us to do anything that is not for our eternal good. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17 we read this, For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Whatever it is that we are going through, God intends for our welfare. Just a few chapters back, we looked at how all things work together for good for they who love the Lord, who are called according to His purposes. We are reminded of Joseph and how his brothers intended what they did to him for evil, but God intended it for good. So this morning, don't be afraid of the will of God in your life because it is good. It is precious. It is pleasant. Pleasant in the sense that when His will is revealed to us, it is something that we are made willing to do. As we move through this life, God is in the business of maturing us. As we grow, His demands on our life change. Through the experiences of life that God gives us, He matures us so that when He comes and His will is revealed, we are equipped and ready for whatever it is that He calls us to do. But God will never lead us to a place that we are not ready to go. God will always prepare us before He leads us to where we are going. I'm thinking specifically of Genesis 22 when God called Abraham to offer Isaac on the altar. For years, God had been nurturing and preparing Abraham. And Abraham passed the test. I think of Israel and their wilderness experience. Only Joshua and Caleb seem to have learned that lesson well. All of the people had been equipped, but only two were willing to follow. When God reveals His will to us, it is because He knows that we are ready. The question is, will we follow Him or not? And the third thing that I see about the will of God is that it is perfect. Nothing we can, there is nothing that we can add to God's plan to improve upon it. When He reveals it to us, we need to realize that God sees the end of the matter that you and I cannot see. He knows the paths that you and I are going to take. He knows the obstacles and valleys that you and I are going to go through in life. He knows where the provisions are that He is going to provide for us along the way. His plan cannot be improved upon, but we must be willing to follow it to live in victory and blessings. There is no better place for us to be than in the perfect will of God. And Paul concludes with a demonstration of God's will. By yielding our bodies and our minds to God, we will be able to prove or live out God's will before a world that is looking to us. When the world sees you and me living the spiritual life that we are called to, they will know that we have been transformed by the power of the gospel of grace. And as a result of our getting where the Lord needs us to be, the Lord can bless our lives. Souls will be saved. God will be honored. We will be an awe-inspiring weapon, mighty in the hand of God. We will be proof positive to a doubting world that God can take the worst 
and make the best of it. We will be evidence of His power to a perishing world. We will finally be the salt of the earth. We will finally be the light of the world. We will finally be the city that is set on a hill. And as a result of that, they will see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. So the secret to holy living boils down to God having control over our minds, our bodies, and our wills. Does that describe your life this morning? Is God in absolute control of all that you have and all that you are? Well, first, the question is, are you saved this morning? Have you confessed Jesus as the Christ and have your sins washed away through baptism? Uh, the second aspect of salvation would be, is your mind being renewed by the transforming power of the Word of God on a day-to-day -day basis? And then third, have you discovered and surrendered your life to the will of God? Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. If you answered no to any of those questions I just asked, then you stand in the need of repentance. If you are subject to the Lord's invitation this morning, Jesus invites you, and we stand and sing to encourage you. At your heart that's weary, tending a load of care, are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burdens you bear? Do you know?
this day. Thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity for us to gather with each other and learn more about you. And Lord, please be with the people who are sick and hurting and facing procedures. Please give them your healing hand and your comforting hand, Lord. Lord, please be with us as we go on for the rest of our day and be with us till we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen.